Hello, hello, and welcome to the Keto Answers Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and this week joining me is Dr. William Bill Davis. You might know Dr. Davis's work from his books like Wheat Belly, but he's a quite an exuberant guy, and he has been taking on the establishment of the medical community head-on for many years now. In this episode, we chat about a lot of stuff, um, including what we're using or have used in the past for blood markers and why there's some miscommunication and misinformation from most physicians when they order your blood and how they interpret it and how they recommend you make health interventions. This guy is one of the most fascinating characters in all of health today, and he's always on the cutting edge and trying to learn something new. I always learn something when I talk to him, and I don't think this is any exception for you either. So just tune in and enjoy, get out your pens and pencils and take some notes. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and the best information about the ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. Doc, thanks for joining me on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. So you are a trained as a cardiologist, correct? That's right. Starting out in uh, what's called interventional cardiology a number of years back, which is all the uh, heart procedures. Okay, great. So you are also one of the first people to be outspoken against grains and wheat in our in our diet. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about that and kind of how you made that discovery and went through that and how it reflected maybe in your practice? Yeah, this goes back uh, a little over 20 years ago when we, we set up what was called a heart scan device, CT heart scan device. Actually, it was the original heart scan device, which was called an electron beam tomography device, an EBT device, or what some call an ultra-fast CT, because the heart's a moving object. And if you want to measure plaque, if you want to precisely quantify atherosclerotic plaque in the coronary arteries, these arteries are only about three millimeters wide. And they're, they're actively moving. So it's very difficult to, to measure plaque precisely and track it over time. Well, this device was the first device that could do that. We started to track a lot of people, thousands of people in my area, the Milwaukee area. It's one of the first scanners in the country. And it became clear that when you put, when you do the conventional things, put people, and this is 20 some years ago, put people on statin drugs, aspirin, beta blocker, cut their fat, exercise, all that stuff, it does not work. It's a miserable, utter failure. We helped publish some of those data and it's remained true ever since. You can throw all the statin drugs you want, for instance, at people's heart scan scores, but the score will increase 25 to 30% per year, no, no matter what statin you use, no matter what dose you use and low-fat diet, all that stuff. So it became clear conventional answers were ridiculous, were useless. So I set out, because I had a whole bunch, I had thousands of people very upset, freaking out, because their heart disease progressed. And of course, my colleagues would tell them such things as, let's do the real test, a heart catheterization, to see if you need stents or bypass, which, by the way, is malpractice. You cannot put people with no symptoms who exercise or active through uh, a preventative bypass surgery, but believe it, I saw it done numerous times. And to me, that's criminal behavior, but nonetheless, that is how my... So was it just like an exploratory my, thing where they would just dig in there, even without symptoms, just to, to determine risk at that point? Yeah, my colleagues are very good. They had these lines uh, well rehearsed. John, I can't, I can't guarantee your safety. You're a walking time bomb. I can't be responsible for your safety. And so they persuade these nice people who have no business going through invasive heart procedures like heart catheterization, stents, atherectomy, bypass surgery. They would persuade these nice people, teachers, businessmen, housewives, to go through prophylactic stents and bypass. That's what I saw happening. And I'm trying to say, put a stop to this nonsense and say, no, no, let's try to understand why this happens. It's clear that the conventional answers are ridiculous. That is that. By the way, you know what the consensus answer was to this? Don't repeat heart scans to look at the growing plaque. Just ignore it. Don't look for it. Wait till they call you with chest pain or a heart attack. No joke. That was the conventional answer, which I found ridiculous and disgusting. 
And so I, I set out on my own course to understand why this was happening and to try to develop easy means, if possible, for people to gain control over this progressive process of growing plaque. Because if you allow plaque to grow in the heart's arteries, the coronary arteries, people eventually die within a few years or have a heart attack or something. And bypass surgery or stents are not good prophylactic procedures. They don't prevent. You cannot prevent a future heart attack with those kinds of procedures. Right. So it, it taught me all these new lessons, like vitamin D. When I added vitamin D about 12 or so years ago, it was the first time I saw heart scan scores not just slow, but drop. And I mean drop precipitously, 36% reduction, 48% reduction, 64%, 84% dramatic jaw-dropping reductions in heart scan scores. Were you you testing them before to see their levels uh, and what people were at as far as how you Yes, exactly, because I'm in Wisconsin where it's winter, about 10 months a year. And even in the summertime, if you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt, maybe you get some vitamin D exposure to the skin. So vitamin D deficiency here is rampant, less so in California, of course. But as you know, even in California, Miami, and Honolulu, there's still rampant vitamin D deficiency. So it's much worse here. And people would typically start in this climate in, say, January with a 25-hydroxy vitamin D level of, say, 15 nanograms per milliliter, sometimes zero. And so there's tremendous benefit to replacing vitamin D. But the path that led me down the elimination of wheat and grains was if you don't rely on this absurd notion of cholesterol testing, that is this ridiculous, outdated, 50-year-old method developed as a crude index of cardiovascular risk that is should have been scrapped many decades ago, but has been kept alive because it provides billions of dollars to big pharma. If you do instead better testing, in addition to such things as a 25-hydroxy vitamin D, if you do advanced lipoprotein testing, uh, look at the actual particles in the blood that carry proteins and fats and so on. You see right away, high cholesterol is not the issue. I call that the kindergarten version of understanding how heart disease is caused. What you see right away is almost without fail – People with, who've had heart attacks, have high heart scan scores, had bypass, have cardiovascular disease, have an excess of small LDL particles, small oxidation-prone LDL particles. These things, these little particles last longer, five days rather than two days, like the large LDL particles. They're very glycation-prone. They're very adherent to the artery wall. They're very inflammatory. And only two foods – Only two common groups of foods provoke formation of small LDL particles, grains and sugars, period. Not pork fat, not butter, not beef. It's only grains and sugars. So I asked people specifically to remove wheat because wheat is the kind of the dominant grain. It's not triticale and sorghum, right? It's mostly wheat as well as corn and rice and oats. I asked them to remove the grains and sugars. Small LDL would drop to the floor. Typical starting number would be 2,000 nanomoles per liter. That's how it's uh, reported on a lipoprotein test. And it drops to zero or some other very low number, like 100. In other words, it wasn't just a little bit better, like it was a statin drug. You get virtual obliteration of the abnormality. And what I saw along with this was dramatic control over cardiovascular risk. I, I When I was younger... I'd be called back into the ER or the hospital numerous times a week, even in patients on statin drugs, to fish them out of heart attacks, sudden cardiac arrest, and those kind of things. When I started putting people on vitamin D, eliminating grains, fish oil, and some of the other strategies we now use, uh, heart attacks, heart disease came to a halt. I didn't need. I used to do as many as ten heart catheterizations and angioplasties a day. The need dropped to zero. The only time I did procedures was for people who were non-compliant or didn't give a damn, or people who did things like smoke. Um, uh, uh, in other words, people who just follow a simple menu of strategies had virtually no heart attacks, no chest pains, no heart failure, no ch- nothing, nothing. And so that led to uh, asking questions like, why? Why would the food that the USDA, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics all agree that our diet should be based largely on healthy whole grains and low fat. Why don't, why don't we do the opposite? Heart disease in particular comes to a halt. But it was all the other lessons I learned. As I'm doing this for heart disease, 
I, to be honest, I didn't really care that much about rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or acid reflux or ulcerative colitis. But people would come back and say, you didn't tell me my rheumatoid arthritis would go away. You didn't tell me I'd lose 73 pounds and I'd drop from a size 24 to a size 4 dress. You didn't tell me my seborrhea and psoriasis would disappear. You didn't tell me that my migraine headaches, IBS, and plantar fasciitis would stop. So <laughs> it became a, a vivid illustration of the power of these basic strategies. And it, I stumbled on this all because of coronary disease. Right. Well, I was looking the other day, <laughs> as morbid as it sounds, at the top 10 causes of death and heart disease is up there at the top. Um, this is obviously this isn't something that we, we don't have a good standard of care on as far as treating it or preventing it. Like you said, the, the food system is kind of the opposite of what we should expect for this. Um, you just, you hit us with a lot of great information there. I want to start pulling some of those things out. So one of them would be just cholesterol and, and you said a fractionated li lipid panel. Many times when people go to the doctor, the doctor orders a standard lipid panel, which is essentially just looking at two different lipoproteins, HDL and LDL, which people think those are cholesterol. Those are actually things that carry around cholesterol. But um, can, can we just unpack why it's not appropriate for doctors to look at that panel and say, oh, just because your total cholesterol number is quote unquote high or outside the reference range that we're going to put you on a drug to lower things and not address dietary lifestyles. So for instance, if, they're, <laughs> if their HDL is high, they just don't even care. They just look at a total number. Like, Why is this a problem in taking labs? I mean, the traditional labs are just a CBC and an LDL panel with, you know, standard, you know, triglycerides, HDL and LDL. Yeah, it's shameful that cholesterol panels are the basis for cardiovascular disease uh, prevention because they're nothing of the sort. So as you know, total cholesterol is, as the name suggests, it's the total quantity of cholesterol within all fractions of, of blood particles. And, but you and I know that we're, we're cholesterol creatures. We're made of cholesterol. And this idea of reducing cholesterol is an absurdity. You can't reduce cholesterol in the body because you die. 25% <laughs> of all uh, fatty acids in a plasma membrane, whether it's in the brain or heart or stomach, whatever, is, is cholesterol. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a fundamental constituent of cell membranes. So that's one. Right. And I've seen studies recently, too, that, that show that women in particular with higher cholesterol numbers actually are protected against all cause mortality later in their life. And, and, yeah. You know, we, we go on and on about this type of stuff as, as far as we can. But it's generally not a good thing to think about bottoming out and getting your cholesterol numbers as low as possible. Lower is not better, per se. Exactly right. Even at a more fundamental basis, the total cholesterol value is a, is a combination of three values. It's the cholesterol and the high-density lipoprotein, HDL, cholesterol. It's the cholesterol and the low-density LDL fraction. It's the cholesterol and the VLDL, very low-density lipo, uh, lipoprotein fraction. So it's total cholesterol comprised of those three separate fact, fractions. Well, here, here's something, and I know I'm preaching to the choir. Let's say you do something really good. You lose a bunch of weight. You start exercising, you drink some red wine, all kinds of good stuff. Take vitamin D and your HDL good cholesterol goes from say 40, which is not that good, to 90, which is very common in this lifestyle. So that means your HDL went up 50. That means your total cholesterol was brought up by 50 as well. But the unsuspecting primary care doctor says, well, John, you need a statin drug because your total cholesterol went up. In other words, the HDL went up, which is a good thing. The HDL is one of the numbers in a cholesterol panel that is actually valid and good right. and helpful. Uh, so HDL goes up 50, the doctor tries to treat it with a statin drug, which is a completely absurd idea, yet they still do that, and they still use total cholesterol to track risk. And as you point out, total cholesterol is a lousy, a miserable uh, predictor of risk. In fact, I advocate that you shouldn't even look at it, ignore it, cross it out, black it out, because it has no meaning whatsoever. It's such a, a messy, silly number that no one should be paying attention to it. Another problem with the cholesterol, I mean, there's many problems. But we only have time to cover a handful. The LDL cholesterol is actually not measured. It's based on a crude, outdated equation that's 50 years old called the Freewald calculation from the NIH. It was, it was meant to be – it wasn't an evil thing. You know, Big Pharma is a very evil influence on society nowadays. But this was not done for evil purpose. This came from the National Institutes of Health. And the calculation from Dr. William Freewald for LDL cholesterol was meant to be a crude way of estimating the cholesterol in the low-density lipoprotein fraction. That's all it was meant to do. Uh, but they recognized it was deeply flawed. 
that it was a crude uh, equation, a very crude approximation. It's thrown off by numerous factors. If you change your diet, your LDL cholesterol is invalid. Yet it's the basis for billions of dollars of statin drug treatment every year, this what I call fictitious LDL, which is it, it, when you compare it to real indexes of risk, you find that LDL cholesterol is nothing more than a wild guess. It is not, does not resemble reality at all, yet is the basis for all statin drug therapy. Another problem we have, of course, uh, the, the basis for statin drug therapy is essentially marketing. In other words, if, if I said to your, your listeners, listen, if you want to buy the best car, I'm not picking on Ford or GM. <laughs> this is just an illustration. If I said, Ford makes the best car in America. And you ask me, how do you know that? And I said, well, we performed a study. We compared Ford to GM and Toyota. And you said, well, who paid for the study? I say, Ford did. <laughs> you, you, of course, would say, well, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to even pay attention to that. Right. But that's right. the basis for most statin drug clinical trials. Pfizer, Merck, and AstraZeneca paid for the clinical trials. Yet my colleagues believe it and take it hook, line, and sinker and think that Studies like the Jupiter trial are valid. They are not valid. They're garbage. Yet they are, are the basis for advocating for statin drug therapy. At best, statin drug therapy might reduce cardiovascular risk by 1%. Yet we're told it's 36 to 55%, which is a, that's ridiculous. That's a marketing number. That's not, the, that's not the truth. So we have this world where the primary care docs and the cardiologists, my colleagues, twist people's arm, guilt them into taking statin drugs, for a class of drugs that has little, if any, benefit at all, but they're highly profitable. Right. And so if somebody were to get a more accurate measure, you, you mentioned a fractionated uh, panel. And so can we just talk about what that is and maybe how people can get that order from, from their physician? There's a lot of things that, that people go there, they're told one thing, but they don't realize that they have, they have some power when they go see their doctor. You can ask for tests. And I mean, what I usually suggest is that if when you ask for a test from your doctor and they don't want to comply with it, it's time to find another doctor. <laughs> Good for you. That, <laughs> I agree 300%. Um, so uh, the world of uh, what's called the bad terminology, but advanced lipoprotein analysis has evolved over the years. I've been doing this for 20 some years. Um, the best technique remains today, NMR nuclear magnetic resonance uh, lipoprotein assessment. It's become the gold standard, NMR. Some of the older methods kind of fallen apart. Some of the companies that were doing it kind of folded. So NMR is the method you want to uh, go after. Uh, uh, Liposcience is one company, Spectra Cells another. There's some others. The doctor should be uh, readily conversant in this. But as you point out, most are not. Most will say stupid things like, I don't know what that is. Insurance won't pay for it. Uh, you don't need that. And I, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. Walk out the door. Don't even pay the bill. Just walk out. Right. Well, I, I order So I order cash all the time. And a general uh, LDL, uh, traditional lipid panel is about 5 to $15. And an MR panel is 65 So it's not, it's not like a crazy, <laughs> it's not like it's thousands of dollars. I mean, you're looking at the marginal <laughs> difference here. That's right. And Medicare has been paying for for years. So this idea it's not covered by insurance. Don't don't no one should accept that nonsense. It is paid for for the most part, and it yields much better information. But the, I think the reason why we don't hear more about it is because you know the world is run by big pharma and big the medical device industry. They dictate what we hear, and that's why on TV you see direct consumer drug ads, and ABC, NBC, and CBS no longer report on the problems in healthcare because they're afraid to because they don't want to antagonize their biggest advertisers. And so what we hear is very selective now. Um, uh, uh, and they don't talk about lipoprotein testing, because if you did lipoprotein testing, you see right away, the issue is not high cholesterol, it's not fat. Fat has nothing to do with cardiovascular risk. It's all about carbohydrates that cause a rise in small LDL. And there's, and there's a very solid science, by the way, for why that is. It's a process called liver de novo lipogenesis. It's a very well sorted out process. It's it, it Briefly, it's a conversion of carbohydrates, such as the amylopectin A of grains or sucrose from uh, sugary foods, into triglycerides. And when you flood the bloodstream with triglycerides, it affects the composition of lipoprotein in the bloodstream, and it causes formation of small LDL and other distortions. And that's how you get heart disease. So, so we have this peculiar situation where the American Heart Association, 
U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, USDA, food pyramid, food plate, all that stuff, advocate a heart disease causing diet, a diabetes, type 2 diabetes causing diet, a weight gain promoting diet. And then doctors come to your rescue with drugs like statin drugs or blood pressure drugs or type 2 diabetes drugs. So, you know, you got to believe Big Pharma has its hand in all this because they are profiting handsomely from this series of blunders and use our colleagues as the unwitting uh, um, uh, uh, deliverers of this ridiculous message. But the, the good news, this sounds very similar. The good news, as you know, is once you get these concepts, your listeners are given extraordinary control over their health, their appearance, uh, not having a heart attack. You know, we're reverting really back to the way humans have done it for millions of years, where heart disease is unknown. You know, primitive cultures before they're exposed to Western foods have no heart disease, they, as well as no dementia, virtually no cancer, no uh, ulcerative colitis, no autoimmune disease, no acne, no dandruff, no skin rashes. They have worms, infestations, and, and injury, but they don't have any of our modern diseases of civilization. Right, the preventable stuff. And yes. so I just want to go over quick and, and touch back on this. I think it's something very useful for people to to actually go to their doctor with. So you, we, we're talking about an NMR lipid profile. And so what this does, and correct me if I get anything wrong here, it you're able to actually separate out the particle size, which is really important, like we said, the small, dense ones are the ones that are going to be very inflammatory and damaging to your body. And you can actually see how many of those ones are available, so that, you know, very direct, instead of making a guess like we traditionally do with LDL numbers on a standard uh, lipid profile. Is this correct? Absolutely. And it will be sobering to your listeners to see, for instance, so I, I saw a lot of people do this. Guys were famous for this. I follow the, the diet doc. Except on Friday. Friday's my pizza day. Right. <laughs> and I have to have two slices of you know conventional pizza. And you would see small LDL particles jump from zero, or another low number, to 1,800 or something like that. It was very, very graphic. But it taught me and taught us very quickly that the, uh, the factors that cause heart disease have nothing to do with saturated fat, total fat, et cetera. It has to do with anything that initiates this process forming small LDL. That is where your liver converts sugars to triglycerides. And that's why triglycerides in, in a conventional lipid panel, the triglycerides and the HDL are legitimate measures. The triglycerides are useful. So if triglycerides are above 60, 60 milligrams per deciliter, it means you are you have sufficient triglyceride availability to form small LDL particles. And the higher the, the triglycerides, the more small LDL you tend to have. So right. people are often told their triglycerides are 150 or fine, which is ridiculous. No, that means you have a ton of small LDL and substantial cardiovascular risk. But most primary care docs, most of my colleagues, the cardiologists ignore that because the statin drugs are not for treating that. Right, and one of the things that I want to also cover real quick that some people can notice in their lab work that I've seen a bunch with people that I've worked with is that the inflammation I think plays a large part in this. So I think that getting like an, a high sensitivity um, C-reactive protein test alongside of this to see, you know, if that's bottomed out, but you're say transitioning to something like a ketogenic diet, you're removing all carbohydrates, but you have a, you can have a transient spike meaning temporary in triglycerides on a, on a just a flat tr uh, uh, lipid profile, which I've seen correct after people get to more of a maintenance point in their weight. And it's just associated what I've seen with um, fat loss. Have you seen that at all in, in your practice? I'm very impressed you know that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So when you lose weight on a low carb, grain free, ketogenic, Atkin, whatever you want to call it, you mobilize the stored fatty acids uh, uh, in fat cells and they're mobilized in the bloodstream as both fatty acids as well as triglycerides. So the natural process of weight loss involves a big surge in triglycerides, and that has consequences. It causes a transient rise in insulin, blood sugar, blood pressure sometimes. It drops HDL. It has the appearance of a big drop. Um, in other words, there's, there's a, a turbulent period when you people flood their bloodstream with triglycerides, the natural state of weight loss. And it looks worse 
And then so most conventional docs would say, look at that. That's why your low carb diet is killing you. Right. <laughs> oh, what I tell people, and I'm, I'm, this is what you're getting at, is wait till weight loss has subsided. I tell people wait a minimum of four weeks at a weight loss plateau, then check the blood work. And even HDL takes about two years to rise. Don't know why. It takes a long, long time. But that's that's a natural process of weight loss. That's all it is. Right. And so don't get freaked out if that number <laughs> alone, right? right? And, and so that's why I think getting an inflammation marker, getting that, and then also getting an NMR lipid profile and looking at all those things combined is a much better picture and clear. And also just think about it like it's a, it's a trend. Like you, you can't just look at things. For instance, you know, if, if my blood sugar is 80 one day and then I ate a Snickers bar and the next day I went in and it would be 140, then I have diabetes overnight. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way once you cross a <laughs> threshold. And same thing with this. Like once you cross a threshold to having high cholesterol, and this happened to my mom like a couple of weeks ago, I think. It was, she went to her doctor. She was, and she, she's just recently um, toying around with the ketogenic diet. She has what's known as high cholesterol now. And so her doctor wants to put her on statins. And you, you can probably imagine how I reacted to that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, this is something that you need to track over time and have the, a full picture rather than looking at these fragmented things and slices one at a time. And then, like you said, there's, there's a lot of different approaches we can do to modulate this stuff rather than going on a drug. If the things, are, th the things that are damaging are carbohydrates and grains and sugars but then you just use a drug to mask those problems. Like you're, you're not taking away the cause of the problem. So it's, it's kind of like if there was a fire in your room and the fire alarm was going off and you were annoyed by the fire alarm. So you're like, hmm, how, how could I get rid of this? I could probably smash the fire alarm. I could wave a towel in front of it. Um, I can go to another room, but you're not addressing the fire. And, and that's a whole problem with, with this. And I think that's your point as well. It's a perfect analogy. That's what conventional medicine does. It just, it just, bangs on the alarm and ignores the fire. And, and what bothers me most about conventional medicine is that my colleagues continue to pose as experts and they are not experts. They are rank amateurs. They barely understand what it is they're doing because all they're focused on is revenue producing procedures and uh, dispensing drugs. They're not focused on health. And so I'm very grateful for podcasts like yours and people like you because you're saying that's BS. No, 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 no. Let's ask what's causing the fire. Let's put out the fire and don't worry so much about the alarm. And doing that, as you see, yields levels of health that are dramatic, dramatically superior than the kind of purported health that you get from a conventional healthcare setting. Right. And so I think you touched on this briefly before, too. But one of the things that you, you mentioned was that this is a problem that is multifactorial and why it exists, but people generally think, and they talk to me, you know, when they're saying, Oh, well, my doctor said I need to go on statins. And I said, no, this is actually, it works this way. And I try to explain what we just went over. And they say, well, why wouldn't my doctor know that? Why wouldn't they know? Like, is it, is it a function of not having time, not having the education influence from the big pharma company is a little bit of everything. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's all those things. You know, I come from that world and, you know, I grew up as a very poor kid in New Jersey. And so I graduated medical school in my training. I did uh, seven years of training after medical school. So I was dirt broke poor when I first entered practice. And so when these sexy sales reps came up to me and said, Dr. Davis, would you like to have dinner at this five-star restaurant and then go for an all-expense paid vacation in Orlando where we can get your ideas on things? I said, you bet you can. <laughs> So they're very good. They are very good at manipulating physician thinking. Now, it took me just a few years to realize it was stupid and how manipulative it really was. But sadly, you know, that 50-year-old middle-aged doc who has his gorgeous sales rep coming. I mean, it sounds cynical, but that's how the world works in medicine. Gifts, favors, all those kinds of things. And that is how they influence. Because in reality, most doctors do not read the science. We don't have time if they read the science and understood the science, they would see right away, by the way, the science is very tainted. You know, when, when Big Pharma pays $30 million to conduct the study and the CEO is playing golf with the lead member of the study, how do you think that study? I mean, it, the, the data are clear. 80% of the time, uh, the study will come out in favor of the sponsor. Right. And, yeah, and that is bulk. Yeah, it's, it's sad. And, and I remember, so when I was practicing full time, it was six days a week from basically 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then after that, I would say to do notes. 
and work with insurance companies. I literally, and, and I was um, single at the time and didn't, and, and had no life essentially. It was just getting <laughs> my career going. Like I can't even imagine what, you know, if you had a social life, if you had a family, you know, uh, a husband or wife and kids, like how would you ever make time to even learn about these things? And so what happens is, you know, research gets delayed 10, 20 years until it actually comes out. And then that takes 10, 20 years to actually be taught in, in medical schools. And then after that, you know, good, good luck if somebody's in practice for, for 40 years because they're not going to know anything that basically happened 80 years ago for research. Yeah, it is tough. Admittedly, it is very tough for a practicing uh, physician to remain on top of the science It is it, because it's progressing very rapidly. But I think they have to. Uh, you know, I made oh, it a to try to stay on top just because, you know, if, if you imagine you write computer code and you say, you know, I haven't learned a thing since I graduated school in 1993, <laughs> it would right. be small. But that, that's that's what the doc, they say, oh, they didn't teach me that in medical school or training. Well, then you're way out of touch because the pace of knowledge is so rapid nowadays. Right. And so we talked about um, earlier, the like I mentioned, like an uh, HSCRP, high sensitive high sensitivity uh, C-reactive protein, the NMR lipid, pro uh, lipid profile. And have you been using anything else um, or have you seen anything else come out as far as research that could be maybe predictive of risk factors uh, like uh, lipoprotein little a or things like this that you've been toying around with? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, all measures of, of blood sugar are still relevant, as you know, like uh, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, those are helpful. Hemoglobin A1C is also very helpful because, as you know, it's, it's also another index of insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance is a very powerful driver of numerous diseases, heart disease, dementia, cancer, et cetera. So that's also help. A 25 hydroxy vitamin D level as a reflector of your adequacy of vitamin D is very helpful. I, I did a lot of thyroid testing. Now I'm in Wisconsin where iodine deficiency is fairly rampant because we're inland. And uh, as you know, all the iodine on earth is in the ocean. So coastal areas like California, there's some iodine in the soil and thereby in the crops and livestock. But way inland, you know, we do buy produce here from California, but a lot of we don't know where it comes from. And livestock, of course, is local or dairy is local. And so iodine deficiency here is a big problem. Uh, but there's also, as you know, the problem of glandular disruption, endocrine disruption, and the thyroid being the most susceptible of all. <clears throat> there's a ton of thyroid dysfunction. So uh, at least 30 percent of the population in my area has hypothyroidism or other, other forms of thyroid disease. And, and when thyroid dysfunction is present, it's a flagrant cardiovascular risk. In fact, some of the most aggressive heart disease I've ever seen is in people with marginal hypothyroidism in the presumed normal range of TSH. So that's another one. Right. I, I've done a lot of life work with lipoprotein A, and that's a whole other conversation if you want to have that conversation. <laughs> And what have you found there? I mean, this is one of these, I think, well, semi-controversial, is it useful, is it not useful type of markers? You know, I found it very useful, but in a very different way. So I, I took care of hundreds of people with lipoprotein A. So uh, here's, uh, uh, with rare exceptions, and you'll, you'll probably recognize this, a person with lipoprotein A is almost always very slender, BMI 21, 22, is almost always an avid follower of high aerobic activity loves to run long distances, run marathons, be a triathlete, long distance biker, something like that, tends to be very smart. The males tend to gravitate towards uh, uh, numbers-driven careers, accountants, financial analysts, electrical engineers, uh, mathematicians, et cetera. Not so much the females. That could be a sexual, you know, a, uh, a bias a built-in. But uh, And they also are uncommonly uh, tolerant to – calorie deprivation and water deprivation. Now, these are people who get a lot of calcium oxalate kidney stones, for instance, because they don't drink water very well. Uh, and they have excessive cardiovascular risk, heart attacks, et cetera, as early as the late 30s, 40s, and 50s. And it clusters, of course, in families. But So the, the conventional question is, what drug can we come up with for this genetic uh, yes, variant? Right. <laughs> what I asked was a little different. I, I said, this sounds to me like a gene for genetic superiority at survival in a wild setting. These people are better hunters. They outsmart their predators. They outsmart uh, uh, their prey. They can run longer and faster. They can go with 
out for the water for extended period. This sounds to me like a wonderful gene for advantage, for survival. So I asked a different question. And, and by the way, this gene has been enriched. Why would a gene be enriched if it's a problem? It's enriched because it's a genetic survival advantage. So why would this gene for presumed survival advantage also have this alternative face of, of, of excessive cardiovascular risk? What I, what I saw was this in several hundred people. All of us develop problems from consumption of grains and sugars. Everybody does in some form. You might not recognize it. You might not recognize your plantar fasciitis and cataracts as a grain-induced problem, but everybody does. But people with lipoprotein, these very fit, long-distance runners running eight miles a day with a BMI of 21, they develop the same problems, excessive small LDL, high triglycerides, high CRP, high blood pressure, diabetes, prediabetes, much more rarely than other people do. So very common situation, a 40-year-old guy, BMI 22, bone thin, runs eight miles a day on a slow day, and he has a fasting glucose of 110 and a glucose of 157 after an apple. In other words, they have the same problems we do, just worse. So what I did with these people, and, and by the way, a low-fat diet is like a death sentence to these people. Right. And, and so one of the things, too, that you may say this and people go, well, how the hell do they have things like uh, symptoms of diabetes when they're, they're fit and running marathons? Well, they can, they can, like, th this is still a problem with people who are fit and, and have this. And so I think you're going to get there now. Absolutely. So these people, of course, still were doing things like carb loading and pasta dinners and all that stuff and the, and the energy drinks, and they were destroying their bodies doing it. So I did the opposite. I said, no more grains, no sugars. We're going to correct all factors that lead to insulin resistance, vitamin D, fish, all that stuff. Um, but no grains, no sugars. And load up on fats like mad. Saturated fats, buy fatty cuts of meat, never buy lean cuts. Uh, uh, bone broths, bone soups, um, uh, high dose fish oil. We used high dose fish oil to approximate what was found in the Lugalawa Tanzanian study, which is uh, about 6,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA per day, and uh, eating organs, liver, and whatever organs <laughs> you can stomach, because modern people just don't like to eat organs. And what I saw was heart disease stopped in these people. Heart and carotid disease, the two things we tracked came to a stop. And no one was having, once again, no one was having heart attacks, no one was needing stents, et cetera. By doing the exact opposite of what conventional advice told them to do. So, now I'd never published those data, by the way, because it, uh, it was a retrospective, kind of sloppy, real world experience. And I kind of came at this piecemeal over many years. But uh, now what I tell people with lipoprotein A is eat a lot of fat, eat no grains, no sugars, and correct all the factors that uh, disrupt inflammation, cause inflammation, and insulin uh, uh, response. Correct your vitamin D, yeah. your omega-3 fatty acids, magnesium, your thyroid status, your iodine status, and your bowel flora. Yeah, so I think I, I want to continue walking people through maybe some of these other factors that they should be looking at. So like you said earlier, looking at other areas of, of blood sugar control, so fasting glucose, fasting insulin is, I think, one that people don't get run very often. And then also... If you want an oral glucose tolerance test, I don't know if you've toyed around with that at all, but I've, I've seen some people just not respond well to it and then changing a lot of things and, and that being a, a really good predictor for success in the long term. Um, any thoughts on that? You know, I stopped doing glucose tolerance tests many decades ago. I, I did it myself, to, to myself, and it was an yeah, absolute fun. miserable <laughs> experience, yes, because I became very foggy and angry uh, at the high and then very... Uh, foggy, almost passing out at the low. Uh, I, because if, if people are checking, I encourage people to check their own finger stick blood glucose. That is more of a real world experience than the make believe world of glucose testing. So we could argue about that, but I stopped doing it just because I think we had the real world tools of finger stick blood glucose as well as hemoglobin A1Cs. Um, so I didn't find that glucose testing, glucose tolerance testing added any kind of incremental uh, information. <clears throat> Fair. Um, one of the things that I've just seen as a, as a slight advantage to get like way deeper is getting the insulin and the glucose at the same time while going through that, which at home you can only really get the glucose, but it's it's usually a good enough approximator. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned too is the hemoglobin A1C. Um, I've also noticed as being artificially higher as a reference range in people who adopt a whole food or high fat diet. 
And research is showing now that that's more of a function of your red blood cells just living for longer. Um, have you seen this as well? Uh, I think so, but it, my my observation would be informal, and and uh, I, I think that's right. I saw that towards the more recent the last few years of my practice. Okay, and then another thing I want to touch on is vitamin D. So this, when people get it, and they're maybe over a threshold of being deficient, um, you say the thirty one nanograms deciliter. Um, what is the reference range or the, the amount that you want to see people in to, to really correct that? And are you pairing that with, let's say, a vitamin K2 and in certain forms uh, to, to help that vitamin D do what it's supposed to do a little bit uh, better? You know, I, I aimed for many years for a 25 hydroxy vitamin D of 60 to 70, just based on <clears throat> a number of things. One, as you know, the epidemiology suggests there's essentially no more contribution from vitamin D deficiency towards cancer of above about 50, 51 or so. Uh, there's also maximal suppression of parathyroid hormone. High levels of PTH cause osteoporosis and act as a cardiovascular risk factor. So uh, you have to get a, your, your vitamin D into the 50s or 60s to maximally suppress PTH. Right, which this is, this is very important to that. Like I said, you can be 30 at your doctor's office and they will say that, oh, everything's all good here, which that yeah. might need to be doubled for you to be where the research shows has the most amount of benefit. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. And in Wisconsin, that is the rule. Virtually everybody is miserably deficient at the start. And it takes, do in, in this area, it takes doses typically of 6,000 units per day in an oil-based oil preparation. But it would, would not be uncommon in this population to require 12,000, 14,000, 16,000 units to get to that, to that uh, level. With K2, I'm, I'm familiar with the conversation that is in Japan, it's a prescription agent as the MK4, metatetranone. Um, uh, the Rodgerm Heart Study, where there's 57% reduction in cardiovascular risk with um, in higher intakes of K2 from uh, uh, cheese, et cetera. Uh, my skepticism is, I used a lot of K2 over many years, and I never saw any observable benefit in such things as coronary calcium scores or uh, any kind of other measure. Yeah, my, my, my suspicion is, and this is just my suspicion, so I'm speculating, so I have no, I have no basis to, I can't prove this to anybody. I think in the end, because there are microbial species in the colon that convert K1 and such things as spinach and broccoli to K2, at least some form of K2. Uh, I suspect that the apparent need for K2 is really a, yet another manifestation of, of dysbiosis and or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay, interesting. Now, I, I can't prove that to you. That's just my suspicion. Just because I've always been a little skeptical that there's a need for cheese, fermented foods, or you know other products of uh, ruminants. Yeah. Uh, I'm just very skeptical of that because, you know, a lot of wild cultures don't have access to those foods. And why would there be an apparent need for K2? So I just have some – I think there are some holes in the thinking about K2. And so I, I have no objection if someone wants to take, let's say, 180 micrograms of MK7 K2 preparation. I have no problem with that. In fact, I took it for many years also. I just don't feel comfortable with that being the end story on K2. Okay. Got it. So that's that's good advice. Um so what about the fish oil recommendation that you had? Is this something that um, you said about six grams or so? Do you do whatever type of fish? Would you give people a certain quality benchmark? Do you ever flirt with uh, krill to get some of the other benefits in that? You know, the, <clears throat> pardon me. That was for uh, lipoprotein A people. Okay. Yeah, I don't do that. In every, and that was based, by the way, on a very peculiar but interesting study called the Lugalawa study. Uh, which was a study of Tanzanian Bantus, <laughs> which have a lot of, this population has a very large uh, a proportion of lipoprotein A people. And people who had higher intakes of fish uh, living uh, around this very large lake in Tanzania had more benign forms and lower levels of lipoprotein. So it was an epidemiological study, which is weak, as you know. Right. So it's the kinds of studies that lead to nutritional um uh, conclusions are relatively weak, but nonetheless, that's the best data we have. So I used 6,000, but only for lipoprotein A. And everybody else, I used 3,600 milligrams EPA DHA, which, as you know, is still a hefty dose. And I tend to use, as you know, the uh, food lower in the food chain, like menhaden and sardines. I've only used krill, 
for its astaxanthin content, mm -hmm. for instance, ladies who want to have better skin health, because I'm skeptical that you can raise your RBC omega-3 index to sufficiently high levels. I aim for 10% of all fatty acids in the plasma membrane to be omega-3s. And with these relatively trivial quantities of EPA, DHA, and krill, despite being a phospholipid form with uh, slightly better absorption, you really have to take a ton. So I've been only using krill for its astaxanthin content, not necessarily for its phospholipid EPA, DHA content. Okay, perfect, perfect. And then you mentioned also that you were recommending things like orgy meats and bone broth and stuff like that. Uh, can you just explain the the thinking behind that and why those things are important foods for people to incorporate? Because especially with people, who, a lot of people who are listening maybe are new to a ketogenic diet in the first place or switching to a different lifestyle and kind of making these big uh, dietary changes. But what they don't realize is that quality is of massive importance and getting the right nutrients are of mass, massive importance. So I just wanted you to touch on, on your thoughts behind that. Yeah, you know, not an easy thing, as you know, to accomplish nowadays. You have to fight against a number of things. One, the butcher throws it away or thinks it's for your dog. <laughs> or, and your neighbors and friends will go nuts and be absolutely disgusted. So you kind of got to sneak it around. But uh, as you know, organs are the most nutritious part of an animal. And it's a, it's a shame that we tend to throw it away or turn it into dog food. And then the dogs eat better than we do in some ways. Um but uh, a liver, for instance, people always say, oh, isn't the liver filthy? And as you know, the liver is not filthy. The kidneys are a little bit filthy, but the liver tends not to have that much more in the way of uh, the bad things like heavy metals and other organic contaminants. So um, the heightened, and that's why the Inuits, of course, who eat raw seal liver mm -hmm. can do so well without having exposure to um, uh, fresh produce. They get their nutrients from the liver and other organs. So I, I'd like to see a pushback towards more heart and tongue and pancreas uh, and liver and so on. I, I, but, you know, most uh, I'm always surprised when I say that on social media, all the nice ladies are there say, that's disgusting. I can't do that. And so I, I remind them that that's what the grandma did. Right. And grandma right. would slap you up the side of the head if she saw you throwing away the organs. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I, I recently posted something on my Instagram, a chart comparing several vegetables and then a, like a grass-fed cut of meat and then a grass-fed beef liver and the nutrient density of each of those things. And I think the liver won out in almost every right. single category yes. by, by far. And, right. and, and so this is one of those things where like, you're looking at bang for your buck, organ meats have by far the highest nutrient density of any other food on the planet. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and there's there's different supplements you can take now, like desiccated liver and some of these things in castle form. Like you're not going to get nearly as much, but then again, you know, you can eat liver, you know, once once a week, once every two weeks, and, and get a huge amount. There's a lot of fat soluble nutrients in there, so they actually store in your body. But the caps, maybe you just pop them every day and at least get something. I, I recommend people at least doing that if they're not going to incorporate any or they can't get any locally. At, wonderful. I think that's wonderful advice. Yeah. So also but, but one of the toughest things to tackle in modern people, right? The organ meat thing. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and this is just a very recent thing. Like this is, organs were prized for forever. And even like you said, eaten by everyone's gr uh, grandparents and in all, all countries, like everywhere. It was just a normal human thing. So it's just kind yeah. of a weird departure from, from nutrition. You know, I think it's also part of this obsession with uh, cleanliness and sterility. It's, you know, wiping your counters down with Clorox and using hand sanitizers. And I'm not eating dirty cuts of animals. And it's all part of the same fiction. Right. As you know, we should be dirty. We should be digging in the dirt. We shouldn't be washing our hands. And we should be eating organs. Right. Uh, and then you also said fatty cuts of meat and not lean cuts of meat. Can you exp explain on that point of view? It's the same issue, of course. You know, it, it's it's not good People think that protein is somehow uh, this this wondrous thing that's, as you know, that's not true. Uh, protein can be toxic in, in uh, excessive amounts. And thankfully, it's hard to overeat protein because it makes you sick. Um, and people who don't consume enough fat are always hungry. These are the people who say, all right, I've cut grains out of the diet, but I'm always hungry. And they say, but I, I'm still buying lean cuts of meat. I buy the, you know, uh, leanest cuts of ground beef, et cetera. So uh, it's a real job trying to dissuade people, as you know, of this fat phobia that's been so deeply ingrained in them for the last 50 years, getting people to go back to butter and 
uh, dairy, of course, has its own collection of concerns, but the, as you know, the most benign, most healthy component of dairy is the fat. Right. And yet people are still buying non-fat 1% and that garbage. I mean, the great irony, of course, is of all the problems in dairy, the fat is the best part. And that's the stuff they took out. Right. So, and, and then heated it and push it through these little sieves with homogenization and pasteurization, which just completely changes the food from from its natural state in the first place. I mean, that, that's another rabbit hole we could we could go down if we wanted to. Um, yeah. What, what about uh, your inclusion of bone broth? I think it's a great idea. I'm not so convinced that it has these magical properties via glycine, proline, et cetera. I do think we have a relative lack of collagen in the diet, whether we get it through bone broth or eating all the tough parts of meat and slow cooking meat so that the collagen connective tissue breaks down. Uh, or just using collagen hydrolysates, which is the easy workaround, the moderate right. workaround that ladies love because it makes their skin less wrinkled. And, uh, uh, of course, it reverses slowly arthritis and increases joint lubrication. So I, 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 I know there's a very – I love bone broth. So I, you know, I, I think it, it tastes wonderful. It's delicious. It's such a great component of cooking. It, it magnifies all the good tastes in food. I'm just not entirely convinced that it's this magical thing that people talk about outside of – the need for the components of collagen that you can get from a variety of different sources. Right. And, and this is one of the things that people, when they ask, um, so we use a lot of collagen in our products instead of different amino acids or from whey or from beef or, or anything else. And I mean, if you look at what people are eating, they are choosing typically the lean cuts of meat and they're getting enough of those proteins the way it is. People are not getting any collagen in their diet on a normal basis. And if you just look down at your body, I mean, you can see all of your skin. And then everything that connects all of your, your muscles to your bones and your bones together and your vascular system and your intestines, like there's a lot of collagen in your body that you need structurally to build new tissue. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. So whether it's bone broth or chicken wings where you gnaw on the bones and tendons and ligaments and eat the skin, skin's loaded with collagen. Another example, by the way, of of how awful conventional advice is where they tell us, don't eat the dark meat, throw away the skin. <laughs> no, right. no. eat the skin, eat the dark mm -hmm. meat is the best part. The only thing I would advise on that is to not fry those wings in polyunsaturated oils. Oh, true. That's very yeah. true. <laughs> let's, let's just make that clear. Do not go and get those fried wings. You bake them at home or smoke them or something. Good point. Uh, and then anything else that you think people are missing or could use as far as, you know, food products or, or choices, miss, let's say they're, they're changing their lifestyle and, and going away from say a high carb to a low carb type of, type of eating. I know you're a big fan of MCT. Yeah. I use, a, you know, one of the things I've gotten involved with is a program in central New Jersey where we're going to try to stop or reverse mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's dementia. And so this opens a whole new conversation <laughs> that we could talk for several hours on. But one of the helpful components is anything that increases a brain uh, energy use, such as medium chain triglycerides or ketones in some other form, like exogenous beta-hydroxybutyrate, or, or at least an intermittent, intermittently ketogenic diet, uh, as well as improving insulin resistance. So I do a lot of that. One of the things I do harp on a lot is the effort to cultivate bowel flora. So I, I cringe to think that we never made any efforts, I certainly did not, to correct bowel flora before a few years ago. And I, I'm, I'm seeing now the absolute power of cultivating healthy bowel flora. So how would somebody on a low-carb ketogenic diet do that appropriately? Uh, it means... I, I tell people, so uh, those of you who are your listeners who are um, not new to this know all this, but anybody who's new, it really helps, I think, to view bowel floor as a garden, like a springtime garden. So if you were going to make a garden in your backyard to grow tomatoes and cucumbers, you'd prepare the soil, right? Take out the stones and the twigs. You'd, you'd, um, uh, you'd plant seeds for your cucumbers or tomatoes, whatever. And then you water and fertilize it through the growing season. The same process applies to bowel flora. You prepare the soil, which means take away things that disrupt bowel flora, grains, sugars, chlorinated water, herbicide, pesticide residues in your uh, non-organic produce, emulsifying agents like uh, methylcellulose and polysorbate 80 and other processed foods. Then you plant the seeds, 
which would be a probiotics. I use uh, multi-species, high-potency probiotics, and I tend to encourage a ton of fermented foods like kombuchas, kefirs, fermented veggies you make yourself, yogurts, um, et cetera. Kraut. And I'm, a big, oh, I'm a big kraut guy. Go oh, great. Wonderful. I'm sure your house smells odd, but it's... <laughs> oh, I'd buy it. I, I, don't, I don't mess around with making it. It's too much work. Okay. And then the water and fertilizer, of course, are prebiotic fibers that nourish probiotic species. And that's the part people struggle with the most, particularly in a low-carb diet, because we're trying to encourage... I, I, I'm not so averse to legumes as some are, but we use inulin, legumes, chickpeas, lentils, uh, other root vegetables without going too high in carbs that sufficient to trigger weight gain, insulin, blood sugar, et cetera. Uh, I'm getting, I, I won't say we have all answers here. One thing I am seeing, uh, I'm guilty of having underestimated the number of people who have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That is this kind of 24 foot full length intestinal inflammation, I'm sorry, infection with undesirable species. And I'm starting to see now this is actually rampant. It's quite, it's, it's, it's a lot of people. And it was unmasked by people who tried to incorporate the prebiotic fibers and who couldn't. They'd say, I tried to add the prebiotic fibers, whether it was inulin or some legumes or um, some jicama or whatever. Yeah, I'll light They'd those say, people up. Yes, exactly. They'd say, within 20 minutes, I've got gas, abdominal pain, diarrhea, et cetera. Well, you know, so I reason, how in the world can you have that response when all the bowel flora is supposed to be in your colon? What be, it became clear that the uh, bacteria had ascended all the way to the stomach or duodenum way up high, and that's how you get those early symptoms. And that became kind of an easy do-it-yourself-at-home test for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. And so that's the, one of the more recent adventures we've been on, trying to treat or beat back this process called SIBO. And we're actually seeing some very, very, very wonderful results. Right. And so one of the things here is that typically when you test for it, you have to drink a lactulose mannitol solution and breathe into a plastic bag for every 20 minutes for two or three hours, which is kind of a pain. Um, so you said that sometimes when you just eat some of these prebiotic fibers, that gut bacteria that shouldn't be residing in your, in your small intestine, which is the first part of your intestine, that will, like I said, that'll light you up. That'll be like rocket fuel for those those really uh, bad <laughs> bacteria. And you'll you'll usually know. And this is people who get a lot of what I've noticed is energy problems after meals, and especially like bloating and gas, either you know belching or um, getting some toots. Like those people are gonna those people are not reacting well because the bacteria up there is just out of control. So, I mean, one of the things that that I've used successfully in the past is kind of like a kill off period, and then just kind of like a, a wait it out a little bit and then a refeeding period and then a maintenance of that. Um, you don't want to go too crazy. There's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of functional medicine docs who will just go and prescribe all these medications um, or like antimicrobials, um, antifungals and just kill absolutely everything. And that's not what we want either. We want a good balance of things. And so we don't want to like just completely decimate your gut because then it's really hard to repopulate as well. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to do and people can relapse into it back and forth, but you know, that's one of the things that, you know, using something like a ketogenic diet can be good at first without, I think, and going extremely low carb to, to starve off some of those bacteria and then starting to add in some of these prebiotic things, I think is a, is a good move for a lot of people who have these symptoms. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And um, the key, I think, is to recognize it. And uh, we're seeing, for instance, fibromyalgia go away. We're seeing uh, people with IBS just go away. Uh, the psoriasis finally going away. You know, psoriasis will recede to a large degree on a, a grain free diet with vitamin D, et cetera. But the last missing piece, I think, was the beating back the SIBO process. And we're finally seeing these people respond. And so I agree. But I, I agree. It's a tricky process to deal with. There's a lot of nuance, a lot of finesse involved. What's your nutrition look like on a day to day basis? <laughs> well, it's the ultimate test right here. Huh? It's the ultimate test right here. Well, I've been, uh, let me qualify this first by saying I've been doing something very unusual. And that is, I've been cultivating a very specific strain of Lactobacillus reuteri. It's called ATCC PTA 6475. Uh, based on, this is going to sound a little odd, uh, based on a series of studies that came out of MIT over the last few years, where they showed that 
supplementing this very specific strain. It has to be so, – the best data is this one strain. The, <coughs> pardon me. The lactobacillus roideri, ATCC, PTA6475, accomplishes some very dramatic effects, such as dramatic increase in skin healing. It cuts uh, skin healing in half. That is, if you were going to take two weeks to heal, now it takes a week. Skin thickness is dramatically increased. Dermal thickness increased. Collagen deposition dramatically increased. Exponential increase, far more than collagen accomplishes, by the way. Um, it increases testosterone, not incrementally, but exponentially in older mice. Um, and uh, in, it, it doubles or more blood levels of oxytocin. Um, and this, the oxytocin effect has been corroborated in humans as well. It's not just mice. And we know that increased levels of oxytocin do a number of things. One, they turn off appetite. They also increase bone density. It also increases uh, your potential for losing weight dramatically, particularly from visceral tummy fat. Um, it has a number of other beneficial effects, including a dramatic increase in uh, collagen deposition in the, in the dermis, in the skin. And so we've been doing this. And what we did was we got this very specific strain and we make yogurt out of it in order to increase the bacterial counts. We make yogurt in the presence of prebiotic fiber. So we make yogurt, for instance, uh, either dairy or non-dairy like coconut milk, but add something to nourish this, the, the uh, bacteria like inulin or uh, potato starch or sugar, something to nourish the bacteria. And they'll consume it, of course. So it's not present in the final product. And we presumably increase counts to the billions, to trillions. And we consume this yogurt and we're seeing extraordinary things. The, you know, the ladies get excited when we talk about skin health. And the ladies within three to four weeks are reporting a dramatic decrease in wrinkle depth. Um, uh, the older ladies are reporting that uh, the senile purpura, the purplish discoloration they get on bruising is no longer happening uh, neck wrinkles are disappearing. Veins are disappearing. Uh, we're, uh, stuff that draw, drops my jaw even to, to this day. And uh, I'm not selling anything here. I'm just telling people. Well, that, I think you should. I think you're a hell of a salesman. And I want to buy this stuff immediately. Where, where can I get this yogurt? Uh, so this very – now, what we don't know, because the MIT people only use this one strain and they use a different strain in humans um, – Odd, you know, I, I'm unclear why, but there's a company called BioGaia, B-I-O-G-A-I-A. -I -I -A. It's a Swedish company. You can Google them. And they sell this specific strain, this lactobacillus reuteri. Reuteri is R-E-U-T-E-R-I. And by the way, your listeners can find all this in my Wheat Belly blog and my Undoctored blog. I have it in like five different blog posts because I figured this out piecemeal. I didn't one day figure the whole thing out. I kind of I, I made yogurt first with half and half and cream and it made it huge, thick, delicious yogurt. Then I added prebiotic fibers and you get this cream cheese like delicious yogurt. By the way, the yogurt you make this way, if you use dairy, but some to some lesser degree with coconut milk also, the yogurt you get is far richer then the watery junk you buy in the grocery stores is far better. So, so even what is the taste, process on this? I, I've never made my own yogurt before, so I'm a little naive here. Do you just put, mix it in and leave it in a container in your fridge, or how does it work? Yeah, uh, well, let me just – it's easier to do dairy than it is non-dairy. So let me tell you dairy first. So typically – and by the way, I'm sure the, the yogurt aficionados will find flaws in what I do. So I'm not pretending to be a yogurt expert. Well, who cares? Yeah, who cares this is just that? how I cultivate this one species. I take a quart of organic half and half. Uh, I throw in a tablespoon of typically inulin or glucose or dextrose or potato starch because the bacteria need that to, besides the, the lactose. Uh, and I started with one billion CFUs of that strain. I, I bought it from the BioGaia people. It comes as a, a hard tablet, oddly, with 100 million CFUs or organisms per tablet. So I crush the tablets with a mortar and pestle or you can use a hard glass or something. And you, you first make a little slurry of it. So you mix the bacteria, the prebiotic fiber, a little bit of the cream or half and half, and then re add the rest of the cream. And then you keep it at about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Some people use a instant pot. Some people use a rice cooker. Some have used a sous vide. Um, I just use, to be honest, my oven. I turn the oven on for about a minute, you know, whatever temperature, 300 or so, just for a minute, because you can't heat the ball. I use a glass bowl. If you heat the glass, it'll kill the organisms. 
So just enough to heat the air to about 110. You can use a thermometer to check. And I do that every four to six hours. And in within about 24 hours, 36 hours, you have yogurt. And I go a little extra because you want as much, you want a high account uh, of bacteria as possible. And then you eat half a cup a day. And then these all these incredible things happen, which took me by surprise. I didn't expect to see such rapid people are recovering from exercise faster. They're getting improved aerobic and muscular performance. No one has yet tested their testosterone or bone density. So that'll come long term to, to corroborate whether that also occurs in humans. But so far, everything observed in mice has played out in humans, at least in this one uh, 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 little area. These studies, by the way, from MIT, I'm kind of um, abbreviating what these people did. These were exhaustive, very elegant, very detailed studies, very well done. And so I'm, I'm not surprised. That's what caught my attention was how well done these studies were. And now we're seeing a lot of these effects play out in humans. And so, oh, anyway, that ends your question. What I, so one of the peculiar effects of this yogurt is it turns off your interest in food 100 percent, even more than MCTs. You know, MCTs are great for turning off appetite. Uh, right. But but this stuff now, now some people may not want that effect. And it seems to uh, apply more to people who need to lose weight, but it turns off uh, appetite almost completely. You almost have an aversion to food that lasts at least six hours. So it's a real terrific assistance to fasting, by the way. So I'll have a bowl of this yogurt in the morning with, say, uh, you know, half a cup of blueberries or whatever. And I won't be interested in eating anything till it typically three o'clock in the afternoon at the earliest. And then I'll have something to eat and I find I'm eating not that much because I just don't feel like eating anymore. This, this might be a silly question, but you don't have to worry about any kind of spoilage when you're at that temperature for for that long, for 24 hours or more? No, it, when you get to the 72 hours where you start to get spoilage and fungal <laughs> uh, contamination, uh, just as you would with any kind of fermentation with your veggies and sauerkraut, right. etc. Yeah, so it's, uh, now, I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, and by the way, no one should use raw milk for this. There's nothing wrong with raw milk except if it's contaminated even with a little bit of, say, listeria or staphylococcus. You're crazy. When you, yeah, they grow because you're cultivating the species that are already in the dairy. So you, if anybody's going to use raw milk or, or any kind of raw dairy, you've got to heat it to 180 degrees first for a few minutes to kill off anything, which, of course, defeats the whole purpose of raw. Right. So. Um, but you gotta be careful. You don't want to, because if if you made a mistake and you amplified the listeria count, you die by eating. We don't want that. We don't want that. Right. Well, so. luckily I, I can't do that because I just moved to Austin, Texas, where it's illegal to get raw milk, which is absurd. Oh, okay. It's absurd. okay. <laughs> big big right. big downside. Um, great. But well, it's really cool. It is a and yeah, by I'm way, testing it out. So I'm, I'm going to make show, it. This is a very preliminary experience. I've been doing this maybe two months. I've had you know a couple of dozen followers of my program where we, we converse online once a week and we have a virtual meetup. We have this video conferencing and a bunch of people are doing it, but they're all telling me the same thing. They're saying, I can't believe it. This one woman on the last virtual meetup said she went, she, she couldn't even tell. She, she had her, uh, her audio muted and she couldn't wait to tell us. She finally gets on and says, I went to the grocery store and I gave the woman my ID and she said, there's no way you're 62. You're not even 40. <laughs> the compliment. And she said, within three weeks, she had always been plagued by these wrinkles in her neck, these horizontal wrinkles. And she said that and her facial wrinkles disappeared within three weeks of doing this. I mean, stuff that you hear, like, no way. But it seems to be over and over and over again. So I, I think we're seeing some real effects. So it's a real cool – there's still lots of lessons to learn by doing this, but it's, it's proven me a lot of fun. So is that all you're eating is just that yogurt? No, no. <laughs> but, but, so in the afternoon, I'll have some meat and some fat and some butter and some veggies, the same sort of thing that all your listeners are doing, nothing unique in it. But uh, this this new experience has has uh, uh, trimmed my need to cook a whole lot. I don't know how long this will keep up, but it, it's it's kind of overlapping with this idea that, you know, long term caloric deprivation uh, may be the path to longevity. I think it may kind of interface with that conversation. That, um, you know, you got to wonder if this strategy has the capacity to turn off appetite so dramatically. Uh, and by the way, if your appetite is turned off, the so-called anorexogenic effect 
of oxytocin, it means your oxytocin level has gone up substantially. And that therefore means you'll likely get all the benefits of rise in oxytocin, which is increase in muscle, increased recovery, muscle recovery, uh, mobilization of visceral fat, weight loss, increased bone density, a rise in testosterone. Um, now, this is true. Testicles get bigger and the number of lighting cells that produce testosterone increase and some other effects. I mean, it's a really cool Can't eat too effects. much of the yogurt. Pardon me? Can't eat too much of the yogurt. Get out of control. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> one thing we haven't been able to control for is how much of an oxytocin rise we get. The Chinese did a very interesting study recently. They took oxytocin. Now, they did it intranasal uh, spray, and they gave, you know, the body, human body produces about 8 to 10 units of oxytocin per 24-hour period. So the Chinese study, they gave these people 24 units of oxytocin four times a day intranasal, which should have no systemic effects. It just goes straight to the brain. But it, uh, no change in diet, no exercise program versus placebo, 19.8 pounds lost in two months. Exactly. So this this caused a firestorm. Of course, Big Pharma went berserk because they can't sell oxytocin because they want to sell drugs for $3,000 a month, not a measly $300 a month. And so what they're trying to do is make a derivative of oxytocin they can patent protect and charge you thousands of dollars. In the meantime, you and I can just do such things as raise oxytocin either by yogurt cultivation. You can take the probiotic directly. It doesn't seem to yield the same kind of potent effect, though. You can even get intranasal oxytocin, but you have to get it from the UK. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about that because I don't want to screw the people who sell this stuff. Right. <laughs> but you can do that, too. Um, you don't have to wait for big pharma to develop a derivative. So I think that if we gave any anyone more information than we have in the last hour, their brains might explode. So I think this is a perfect <laughs> place to wrap it up. It's been oh, okay. an awesome action-packed episode. Um, you have a few different blogs and websites, don't you? Um, if you just give people a little taste of where they can find more. Yeah, all these ongoing conversations, I try to make everything as available as possible, is in the Wheat Belly blog. Uh, there's an awesome undoctored blog. Um, uh, I also started uh, an undoctored inner circle. That's only for people. It's, it's a paid membership site. That's only people who really want to deep dive. That's where we have those virtual meetups by video and so on. Uh, but I'm, I'm trying. And of course, the books, the we Belly books on doctored books, because as you know, I support uh, a podcast like yours because, you know, if, if big media is not supporting the message of health because they're too cozy with big pharma, we've got to have these conversations. We have to educate people that people can accomplish so much, as you know, like your listeners, they can accomplish so much on their own. And it ain't coming from John Q. Primary Care or cardiologist. Right. You got to do it yourself sometimes. Appreciate it, Doc. Excellent, excellent conversation. Terrific. Thanks for the time. Keep up the good work. Thanks. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests, and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Bye.